you know, it's easy to experience a high, you know, a sense that, yes, I'm going to make a difference, but then very quickly to go back to our base level. There's a lot of research that, that suggests that most of us go back to our base level of well-being, of self-esteem, of happiness. So the question, you know, the million dollar question in the ultimate currency is how do we attain, how do we enjoy lasting change? Today's lecture is very much about that. There are very few interventions that actually work. Mindfulness meditation does. We know from the Cambridge Somerville study, a five-year intervention didn't work. We know that very often people experience a spike in their, well, in their happiness levels, up or down, very quickly to go back to their base level. Most interventions don't work. Mindfulness meditation does. And today what I will do is I will talk about the art as well as the science of this ancient practice. An ancient practice in the East, relatively new in our part of the world. In terms of behavioral change, the practice that actually had the most difference, uh, that made the mo most difference in my life was when I took up mindfulness meditation. It's a practice, why is it so effective? Because it focuses on the ABC of change. Effective, behavioral, and cognitive. And it works on all three simultaneously. And this is how it is able to overcome, or we're able to overcome, by practicing it, the flood of change, or the flood of habit, rather, that prevents change. And habits are difficult to change. Remember, we first make our habits, and then our habits make us. And therefore, we need a strong inter intervention. Mindfulness meditation is just that. The people who brought this practice to the West, I guess the two people that can be credited most with it are Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who brought transcendental meditation, and Shirunyu Suzuki, who wrote the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. These two practitioners popularized to a great extent this practice. But initially when they came here, it was in the 50s, 60s, you know, it was considered being part of the hippie movement. You know, unscientific, some people considered it voodoo art, mysticism, didn't really catch the interest of the scientific community until the 1970s because one can't argue with results. You see, one of the things that medita meditation practitioners promised coming from the East, promising to Westerners, is calm and equanimity. And very often they delivered. Many people were able to transform their lives in a meaningful, significant way as a result of starting to practice meditation, whether repeating a mantra, focusing on their breath, or praying with intention. It made a big difference, significant difference in people's lives, and science could no longer ignore it. And then a few scientists latched on and started to study this, initially being very skeptical, but very quickly being convinced of the efficacy of this practice. Two of them, John Kabat-Zinn, not far from here, UMass Worcester Medical School, a psychologist there, and we'll talk a lot about his work today. Another person, Tara Bennett Goldman, who bridged East and West who brought the practice of mindfulness and merged it with the practice of cognitive therapy. She studied both and then came up with a, with a method for helping people overcome things like perfectionism, neuroses, anxiety, depression. Right here in the, the med school, Dr. Herbert Benson did a lot of research on what he calls the relaxation response. Again, taking these simple ideas and showing their far-reaching implications for a person's well-being. 